We are live on your DSTV channel 421, Go TV channel 125. This is Joy Newsroom with me, Sweetie Abochi. Our lead stories in this hour, Imani Africa hints they will challenge Senate to make documents it will use in its defense of the sale of its stake to Rock City Hotel before Shraj Public. Also, founder of defunct GN Bank, Dr. Park Wesi Indum, calls on government to pay monies owed contractors to enable them to pay off credits taken from the banks. If they had paid us even one third of that money to the contractors six years ago, there wouldn't be a Gokos or Black Shield problem, there wouldn't be a GM Bank problem, there wouldn't be a problem with any of our companies. They should pay their money. So today, what we are asking is we are saying, let them pay their money. Also, rising cost of building materials forced landowners in the Shanti region to resell their lands. I forced to sell two plots of mine last few years because I wanted to use that, that piece of land for school. I realized the cost of building materials will not help me to do it. So I have to My name is Sweetie Abochi. Do stay for details. In our first story, Vice President of Imani Africa, Bright Simmons, has hinted that they intend to challenge the Social Security and National Insurance Trust to make public documents it will rely on in its defense in the sale of a 60% stake to Rock City Hotel before Shraj. The Member of Parliament for North Tongu, Samuel Okuje Tuablakwa, petitioned the Commission to investigate a potential conflict of interest involving the Agri Minister in a Snit Rock City Hotel deal. Now, speaking on current affairs program news file, Bright Simmons said the Trust owes the public an obligation to let them know what transpired regarding the agreements. I have to be upfront about my uh, incap incapacity on this matter to a certain extent. So our usual sources have failed us and we don't have the full do uh, details of the Rock City um, submissions which have um, characterized or rather qualified it for, for this um, benefit. So some of my comments are about Smith's investment practices generally. And I think I will focus in on why I think um, the country could be better served by the way Smith does its investment. I will not be able to make emphatic comments about Rock City itself because I don't have the information. Great. And, but we hope that in the course of the coming days and weeks, we will be challenging Smith to put out all the information that they intend to submit to Shraj to the wider public. This is not a matter only for, for Shraj. Mm. And we commend the member of parliament who has initiated this inquiry. So let's start off with our concerns about SNET generally and the way that it's managing the pensions of the workers of this country. The truth is, as everybody knows now, the International Labour Organization has an arrangement with SNET uh, in which for, for you know, relatively little money, it conducts actuarial analysis uh, for SNET and that is conducted the most recent one. And the conclusion, the most important conclusion from that study is that if we want SNET to be sustainable, we have to pay double what we are currently paying in terms of our contribution to SNET. So essentially the rate uh, that we contribute at um, to the SNET funds have to go up from about 11% to 22%. This is a huge, huge and massively important point. Because what that means is that we are at a stage where if we don't pay more into SNET, SNET will be unviable. Mm. We also know that ILO recommends we should increase the pension age by about two years as one of the pathways to making sure that the fund is sustainable. And thirdly, this is the reason for why these additional sacrifices are being demanded. Essentially, the reason why you have to pay more, the reason why you have to retire later as a worker in Ghana is because SNIT is experiencing significant falling rates of return. He raised red flags over how SNIT has been investing pension funds in recent times. 
which has impacted returns on investment? I have to be upfront about my uh, incapacity on this matter to a certain extent. So our usual sources have failed us and we don't have the full uh, details of the Rock City um, submissions, which have um, characterized or rather qualified it for, for this um, benefit. So some of my comments are about Smith's investment practices generally. And I think I'll focus in on why I think um, the country could be better served by the way SNED does its investment. I will not be able to make emphatic comments about Rock City itself because I don't have the information. Great. And, but we hope that in the course of the coming days and weeks, we will be challenging SNED to put out all the information that they intend to submit to Shraj to the wider public. This is not a matter only for, for Shraj. Mm. And we commend the minute, member of parliament who has initiated this inquiry. So let's start off with our concerns about SNED generally and the way that it's managing the pensions of the workers of this country. The truth is, as everybody knows now, the International Labour Organization has an arrangement with SNED uh, in which for, for you know, relatively little money, it conducts actuarial analysis uh, for SNED. And that is conducted the most recent one. And the conclusion, the most important conclusion from that study is that if we want SNED to be sustainable, we have to pay double what we are currently paying in terms of our contribution to SNED. So essentially the rate uh, that we contribute at um, to the SNED funds have to go up from about 11% to 22%. This is a huge, huge and massively important point because what that means is that we are at a stage where if we don't pay more into SNED, SNED will be unviable. Mm. We also know that ILO recommends we should increase the pension age by about two years as one of the pathways to making sure that the fund is sustainable. And thirdly, this is the reason for why these additional sacrifices are being demanded. Now, in other stories, founder of defunct GN Bank, Dr. Park Wisindom, is calling on the government to pay money's old contractors to enable them pay back credits taken from the bank to finance the construction of some infrastructure projects in the country. Dr. Indum insists the government's refusal to pay the money is contributed to the collapse of the bank. He was speaking at a press briefing to kickstart a campaign to demand the release of the operation licenses of the bank almost five years after the licenses was withdrawn under the bank to, uh, banking sector cleanup. That's not what an investment company does. You don't go and dig a hole in the ground and then when you come, I go and dig it back up and say, here's your 1,000 or 2,000 Ghana cities. We invest the money. And when you invest the money, it means you give loans, you give credit, you pre-finance or finance activities. And because we know the importance of infrastructure development in this country, we decided, Group Indo, not just GN Bank, uh, but Group Indo, including what used to be called Gold Coast, now Black Shield. We decided that what Ghana needs the most is infrastructure development. And if nobody's credit is good, should that include government? Hmm. Government's credit should be good, not so. Yes, sir. So if you decide to give money, credit, to finance the activities of Ghanaian contractors, Ghanaian contractors, that money, it should come back. So where is that money? That money is with the government of Ghana and its agencies, and they know. They know. The former finance minister, Ken Oforiata, knows. The current finance minister, Dr. Amin Adam, he knows. The head of Cocoa Board, we, we financed Cocoa Roads. They used to be the safest activity you can engage in. We invested with, with, in schools. So many schools, many schools that you might see here and there, it is monies from our companies that pre-finance them. Um, it, you, you go all over the place, you will find it. Roads, bridges, schools, 
um, and, and, and so many others. If you go uh, to this cove, it's a sea defense project, and it's been there. That project was started more than seven years ago. That contractor has spent millions and millions working on that project. Not one peswa has been paid to that contractor. So what used to be about 1.8 billion Ghana CDs, listen to me again. A debt that used to be 1.8 billion Ghana CDs is now more than 7.1 billion Ghana CDs. I'm not talking old Ghana CDs or old CDs. That is real new Ghana CDs. If you convert it into US dollars, it's about a half a billion dollars and it's growing every day with interest. So the government of Ghana and its agencies, if they had paid us even one third of that money to the contractors six years ago, there wouldn't be a Gokos or Black Shield problem, there wouldn't be a GM Bank problem, there wouldn't be a problem with any of our companies. They should pay their money. So today, what we are asking is we're saying, let them pay the money. If government doesn't have the money, there, there are arrangements that can be made. We all know what the situation in Ghana, what it is. So let's come up with a payment plan. They pay us, the customers get paid. The bank you know, rises and other things come. It's as simple as that. Moving on, some prospective homeowners in the Ashanti region say they are being compelled to sell their purchased lands owing to the rising cost of building materials. In recent weeks, cement prices have seen a sharp increase from an average 82 CDs to a minimum of 88 CDs. Cement manufacturers are attributing the price hike to the depreciating CD, inflation and import duties. The new prices have left many prospective homeowners frustrated as they poured in their concerns on Love FM. What have you been able to do on that plot since you bought it from 2019? Virtually nothing. Because any time I plan doing something on I go to the market to ask for prices or for them as we are, then come and plan. But the next time you go, because of insulation, the price will go up. So all your plans that you have to, may have to abandon. And now, like you are saying, the situation is tough. By the time you organize some money to go on the land, something might have happened and that money will be used. In fact, I'm even planning on selling the land because there's a clause that by certain years, if you are not able to develop the land, it will be taken away from you. I was forced to sell two plots of mine last two years because I wanted to use that, that piece of land for school. I realized the cost of building materials will not help me to do it, so I have to sell it out. And it's not easy. Just getting a water in your house alone, you pay at least around 25,000 Ghana. The U.S. ambassador to Ghana, Virginia Palmer, has attributed Ghana's stable security to the professional conduct of the country's security service. She said the professionalism of the Ghana Armed Forces and its allied security agencies, coupled with other factors, have greatly contributed to the safety of the country. Ambassador Virginia Palmer said this in an interview with the media at the Viewing Day exercise as part of the exercise Flintlock 2024 in Tamale. The Faint Log 2024 and Africa Lion exercise brought together 1,300 security officers drawn from five continents and 38 countries. The objective of the exercise is to strengthen the ability of key partner nations in the region to counter violent extremist organizations, collaborate across borders, and provide security for the population. Speaking at the event, Ambassador Virginia Palmer called on the country to address issues of discrimination. What's happening in the subregion is certainly of concern, but Ghana has been free of attack. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one is the professionalism of the Ghana Armed Forces and the other Ghana Disciplined Security Services. Um, a second reason is that the Ghanaian government appreciates that social cohesion and inclusive economic growth are essential to people feeling that they have prospects and, and are not vulnerable to violent extremism. And I think what we have to work on in the region is making sure that there are not groups that are subject to discrimination, that good governance and democracy prevail, 
because the solution to the security problem is more democracy, not less. The Chief of Army Staff Major General Vesma Kwesi Oura said the exercise is a collaboration between like-minded countries with the aim to combat terrorism. Uh, exercise Flint Lock and African Lion has been a very important opportunity for Ghana and other African nations to partner with like-minded countries such as the United States and other international partners to come together to train, exercise in areas pertinent to our fight against terrorism, which has become a contemporary threat, especially in our sub-region. The Deputy Commander of the United States AFRICOM, Lieutenant General John Bernard, said they look forward to exploring new opportunities. I can tell you without a doubt that between African Lion and Flintlock, they are the coin of the realm for our operations, activities, and investments on the continent of Africa. Uh, we have no better partners than the Ghanaian military, uh, with whom I have personally partnered for over 30 years, and we look to explore new opportunities. Now, Ghana's continuous borrowing from European financial institutions will never solve the problem in the country. It would only postpone the challenges. This is the assertion by a senior Ghanaian citizen and Pan-Africanist, Professor Kofi Opukwasari. According to him, the solutions to save the country are within and not external support. The over 90 years professor of religion and African studies raised these concerns, among others, other issues bothering the growth of the country on the sages. I think we should always go to the IMF. We ignore our own strengths, our own abilities. I am convinced beyond any shred of doubt that we are not a helpless people. We have strength, we have energy, we have wisdom, my goodness. So it is only because we have been indoctrinated to believe that we need to depend on somebody. And so when the Europeans came to exploit us, they said, oh, we brought them civilization, we brought them this, we brought them that. But didn't we have our own? We do have, we did have our own, and we still have it, only we have neglected it. And so the more you continue to rely on others, the more you exhaust the abilities, the capabilities that you have, you know? our first request, let's go to the IMF. And then the IMF tells you what to do. Now, who knows better what we need? Is it the IMF, which is the Europeans, or we ourselves? If we believe that the Europeans can solve our problems for us, then I'm afraid we, we deserve our fate. But I don't think we do. We can do everything ourselves if we wake up. But we have been indoctrinated to feel that the Sages airs on Joy News Channel every Saturday at 12 p.m. and features learned senior Ghanaian and global personalities who've garnered experiences from diverse uh, backgrounds. In other stories, continuous borrowing doesn't... Uh, I'll bring you that story uh, in a bit, but moving on, as the CD's depreciation continues to bid, uh, bite hard, Deputy Minister of Food and Agriculture, Yao Frimpong Adu, emphasizes that increasing local rice production is crucial for stabilizing the currency. He noted that 50% of rice consumed in Ghana is imported, which negatively impacts the same city. Speaking at the groundbreaking ceremony for a 100 hectare, hectare rice seed a cultivation complex in Dowenya in the Ningo Pram, Pram district of the Greater Accra region, he expressed hope that the joint Ghana-Korea project will help address the free fall of the city. There's more in this report. Being jointly implemented by the Ghana Irrigation Development Authority, JIDA, and the Korea Rural Community Corporation, KRC, the $7.8 million K Rice Belt project, which began in October 2023 and ends in December 2027, has three main objectives. 
established rice seed cultivation complex through modernized irrigation infrastructure and farmland consolidation, produce high-yielding rice seeds and increase farming household income and alleviate rural poverty. Speaking at a groundbreaking ceremony, Deputy Minister of Agriculture Yao Frimpong Ado emphasized the project's potential to reduce import reliance and stabilize the city. For us in Ghana, it's a blessing. It is a, a good blessing because, as you know, we are implementing the planting for food and jobs phase two. And the whole, the whole idea about the PFJ2 is to commercialize agriculture, to, to, to um, encourage big time farmers to go into commercial agriculture. No, Ghana imports a lot of rice. Uh, out of the quantity that we consume in this country, we're able to do just about half. So the rest of it is imported. And you, you know what is happening to our currency situation. And it has been a recurring when every year, I mean, since I was born. So some of these projects that are coming to expand the scope of our rice production is something that is good that will help us uh, reduce the importation of rice into this country. The project will include land consolidation, preparation, irrigation and drainage canals, farm roads, a pumping station, water pipelines, a night reservoir and a seed drying area. The Korean ambassador to Ghana, Park Kyung Sing, urged farmers to fully embrace the project to enhance the country's food self-sufficiency. Copia head. He can provide, he can uh, share the knowledge how to grow the seed in here. He can provide the, the, the trucks and all the heavy materials over there. But the actual people who is growing the rice is uh, you. So your effort, your devotion, your knowledge is very important for the success of this project. And also my friend here, Deputy Minister's uh, role is also very important. So all of here, you and uh, the people at the back, both back of mine, our cooperation and cooperation between Korean government and Ghanaian government, cooperation with you and myself is very essential for the success of this project. District Chief Executive of Ningo Pram Pram Assembly, Al Latif Tete Amano, highlighted encroachment as a major challenge threatening the irrigation scheme's sustainability. When you look at this, our fertile land, it's a land whereby we can have all days, all months, all year farming. And when I take over office, the challenge our agri sector over here is facing is encroachment of the agri land. The district took it upon itself as a lead, and we make sure that the squatters and the encroachers up to date, we are chasing them out. The Deputy Minister of Agriculture, Yao Frimpong Ado, assured that the ministry is addressing the encroachment issue nationwide. It is the objective of the current uh, Agri Minister, Dr. Bear Champo. He has tasked a certain team in the ministry to go around to see all our agri lands and protect it. And uh, once that is done, we are, we are talking to the AG. So anybody who encroaches, um, the law will take his call. The K Rice Belt project is being implemented in 10 African countries, and by the end of the five year project, Ghana's rice production capacity is expected to cover 80% of domestic consumption. For Joy News, Carlos Caloni, Dawenya. In other stories, the Environmental Protection Agency is engaged in local assemblies across the country to integrate climate change adaptation strategies into their development plans. The stakeholder engagement aims to equip the assemblies with climate consciousness and knowledge. The EPA is seeking to address the increasing vulnerability of communities to climate change impacts. Here's a report by Clinton Yeboah. 
The phenomenon of climate change continues to wreak havoc in the world, and Ghana is no exception. Many parts of the country are recording abnormal flood situations and severe temperatures. Recognizing this, the Environmental Protection Agency has structured a stakeholder training to assemble climate activists, local government officials and technical experts to develop climate-conscious strategies for future development plans. According to the Director of Climate Vulnerabilities and Adaptation at EPA, Dr. Enchibo Siakuamua, the effort is to allow the assemblies to appreciate the diverse climate challenges and opportunities within their respective districts. We have some coming from the coastal community, Cape Coast. We have some from the Middle Belt. Then we also have the transitional zone. So we have Wenchi, Kentampo, and then Savannah in the northern part. So we have Tamale, you have um, Wale Wale, you also have Navrongo. Each of these ecological zones represents seven climatic um, conditions. And so it will allow them to be able to appreciate the differences and how they can share common understanding. Climate change is a cross-sectoral issues and so people might see different issues from different perspectives. The workshops, which cover a range of topics including vulnerability assessments and climate finance access, sought to equip participants with real-life representations of technical knowledge of climate change issues. The participants were taken on a field visit to Fawadi in the Bekwai Municipal Assembly to ascertain the uncovered pits of illegal mining in the area and their replication on climate. The team also checked on some areas in Anyuan Kwanta where there have been perennial floods due to the Oda River overflow. Dr. Enchibo Siako indicates the field visit will inform future support to helping vulnerable communities build resilience against the adverse effects of climate change. It's not like just going to be a talk um, show. We are going to actually make sure that we follow up with the plan that the choir has and see whether some of the things that they were talking about, we can support the assembly um, to structure these issues and then look for financing to be able to address some of these issues. Municipal Chief Executive for Bekwai, Kweku Che Bafor, says preferred recommendations from the team will influence the development plan for the municipality. Uh, the, uh, the, um, or that river basin. They've said a lot about how we, need, what we need to do so that it will, it will, it will make life meaningful for those who, who farm around the place and who have built close to the place which they have to relocate when any time at all it's flat. Like, previously it's about 10 years, 15 years before it gets flooded. By this time, it's year. Uh, and so we have uh, assembly, we have sat, we have got to fashion out. And so, and so we have we have a 10 year development plan. We're going to incorporate whatever we have said in here. If they are not in, we are going to put it in there and work on and, and work on it. Reporting for joining us, my name is Clinton Yeboah. Election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosol, clean fuel and in full quantity, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, together with the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, German Ozone Medical Center, Alternative Therapy, Dental, Wellness and Beauty, Chopbox Technologies, a convenient service and Youth Bridge Foundation. Election headquarters for an informed electorate. Now let's begin with elections in Sunyani, where the Nkranza South Secretariat of the National Democratic Congress has refuted claims its members attacked uh, the parliamentary candidate of the New Patriotic Party in the ongoing limited voter registration exercise. The party at a press conference addressed its constituency communications officer, Ejeni Mbwati Nkwesi, and he said the NPP's decision to bring non-resident thugs to torment new registrants has been a source of tension since the start of the exercise. And Asabit has more. We'll bring you that story in a bit, but moving on, independent candidates for Sunyani East parliamentary elections, Ransford Entry has said the lack of expected development influenced the people's call for him to rescue the constituency based on his track record of championing the interests of the communities. Speaking during a curtsy call on the religious leaders in Sunyani to inform them of his intentions, Mr. Enchi admitted to the enormity of the task ahead, but said he trusted the people to give him the mandate to represent them and use his well-developed network to drive development. Precious Semevo has more. Sunyani East constituency is one of the strong seats of the ruling NPP in the Buno region. The current member of parliament, Kusiyami Acherme, is aiming for a fifth term. 
but a new face and an old son of Sunyane runs for the entry, aims to unseat the incumbent as an independent candidate for the constituency. He said his desire to contest is born out of the constituent's call for a candidate who will prioritize Sunyani's development. He made the remarks after a courtesy call on the Sunyani Traditional Council and the regional chief imam. Whoever knows me will tell you that I never wanted to do politics. I felt I could do something without necessarily getting involved. But at some point I felt that the calls were so huge that I had to listen. I have built strong network, so I thought that this will benefit my constituency. And I believe that when I have the mandate, I am going to do well as an MP. Um, growing up, there were people that I grew up with, some traveled abroad and never came back. But I never wanted to leave. I wanted to leave and help build this city. Unfortunately, without political power, it's been difficult. So I'm going to throw myself in, and I believe that the people are going to believe in me and give me the mandate. Transford Entry said he will offer the kind of leadership that will bring development. It's never about MPP or NDC. It's about Sunyane. It is not because I feel it is an opportunity to amass wealth. No, I feel it is an opportunity to serve my people. And over the years, they have known me. Um, I'm not someone who is... Um, selfish, greedy. I have tried to mentor people. I have tried to train people to become entrepreneurs. And I believe that when I become MP, I'm going to offer the leadership that has been lacking over the years to ensure that Sunyane gets its fair share of the national cake. Akomuhini of the Sunyane traditional area, Nana Kwekusabin said Sunyane indeed deserves a man of MP's track record. But we need somebody. The here will be. Ah, what is it? Yeah, yeah, this year. Come and fight for us. And I know what you want to know. What about you? Dear, as I say, yeah, yeah, Tim, my money, yeah, yeah. As I say, I tell you, you don't need to cook with you. We, we, but who pay the team at the man? No, 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 no. Precious Sam ever join news. Sunyai. Now let's go back to that story from Nkranza South, where the Secretariat of the National Democratic Congress has refuted claims that its members attacked the parliamentary candidate of the New Patriotic Party in the ongoing limited voter registration exercise. The party at a press conference addressed by its constituency communications officer, Jenny Mbwati Nkwesi, said the MPP's decision to bring non-resident thugs to torment new registrants has been a source of tension since the start of the exercise. And as habit has more. In a swift response to a recent press conference organized by the New Patriotic Party in the Nkranza South constituency over an alleged assault on the NPP's parliamentary candidate, the NDC stated that its member of parliament, Manuel Ajikum, is a peace-loving individual and the party remains committed towards maintaining peace within the constituency. The NDC in Nkranza South are peace-loving people who are committed to maintaining the tranquility and unity of our beloved constituency. It is right that this positive attribute of the NDC in Kranza South is what has helped us to uplift the image of Kranza as about 80% of all the infrastructure development were embarked on by the NDC under the leadership of Honorable Emmanuel Kodua Jukum, the Member of Parliament. Constituency Communications Office of the Party, Ajinim Boatin Kwesi, emphasized that the NPP candidate Harriet Opon's violent nature has contributed to the chaos recorded within the Nkranza South constituency. It is unfortunately sad and regrettable that these gains are being won due to the violent nature of Madame Harriet Opon Chiramaten, the parliamentary candidate for the MPP in the Nkranza South. They say the NPP's decision to bring non-residents of the area as well as macho men to torment registrants has been the primary source of confusion since the start of the limited voter registration exercise. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, it will be recalled that on the 29th of March this year, which was a uh, good Friday, Madame Harriet Chiramatain, upon as usual, went to Insunisa with her tax. Notable among them is a guy called Pascal. He is moving around 
brandishing powerful pump action gun, threatening the people always. He is the main cause of confusion and chaos. And this are orchestrated and under the leadership and directorship of Harriet Shramantin Opon, the parliamentary candidate of the MPP. They want the general public to disregard any allegations made by the MPP and treat it as an attempt to divert attention from the party's misconduct. The allegations made by the MPP in their recent press release that was addressed by their secretary are entirely fabricated lies. They are uninspiring lies. This desperate attempt to divert attention from their own misconduct. Ajani Mbwatin, also known as Katasko, however, emphasized that the NDC will not allow itself to be intimidated by the NPP and the police and call on the general public to remain calm and vigilant throughout the registration process. Let me hasten to say that we in the NDC are peace-loving individuals, but we are not cowards. We are not cowards. We are least perturbed by the outmoded political strategy where Harriet is using the police and in the name of we are in government to intimidate our people. We call on all residents of Mkranza to remain calm and vigilant. The NDC will continue to uphold peace and ensure that our democratic processes are protected from the disruptive tactics of the MPP. Join us, Mkranza. And that's it for election headquarters, taking us to a break. When we return, there's business news. Stay with me. You're still watching Joy Newsroom with me, Sweetie Abochi. Welcome back from that break. Now, in business news, some stakeholders within the energy sector are asking governments to invest in power generation and reassess the sector's debt. Head of the Electrical Department at Accra Technical University, Dr. Stephen Bunny, reiterated the need for more collaboration for government's quest to achieving a 10% renewable energy capacity by 2023. He spoke to Joy Business at a stakeholder meeting. This energy supply today is met predominantly by non-renewable energy sources, a mix of petroleum, biomass, and gas with only a small share provided by hydroelectric sources. Dr. Stephen Barney said, the introduction of a series of digital business models for renewable energy products has helped accelerate the expansion of electricity supply to remote communities and simplified payment methods. Sustainability, then we have to, I mean, improve upon our generation. The problem is about generation actually. You know, in energy, generation and demand have to meet. I don't want to go into details, but then we have one, the, the system will pay on the frequency, and at every point in time, the frequency have to balance. So that is why you see that at any point that the frequency want to deviate from the normal, Gridco will definitely take the power off. And there's war between Gridco and ECG as to who is to blame. But Gridco, just like a soldier on duty, if he sees that the frequency is going out of hand, definitely they will knock off some load. Managing partner at Nocheski Solar, Noche Amati Fio, indicated that Ghana's energy sector has some prospects. Time has come for the industry in Ghana. And when I say the industry, test and measurement industry, electrical energy sectors, manufacturing, anything that has to do with power and energy, to take a rise in terms of perfection, in terms of improving on our standards. Luckily for us, Nocheski, in partnership with Chauvin Arnold Group, of France, which is a global leader, European global leader in the test and measurement space all globally, is here with us. And that gives us the opportunity to be able to present not just equipment, but solutions that make a difference. Area Sales Manager Africa for, for Chauvin Anor Award Muad entreated Ghanaian engineers to take advantage of various training programs. Uh, nowadays, the African market is booming in terms of uh, energy production, energy distribution, uh, manufacturing industry, as well as renewable energy. Uh, and this development deserves to be uh, supported by uh, certified and uh, standard-designed uh, measurement equipment like Chauvin Arnoux. 
Uh, that's why uh, we, uh, we Chauvin Arnaud, decide uh, to uh, boost our presence in Africa market. And that's it for business news. We'll be right back with more. Thanks for staying with us. Now let's do some more health stories. The Ghana Mental Health Authority is advocating a proactive approach to combating potential breakdowns among office workers. In a recent training session held for staff at the Economic and Organized Crime Office, emphasis was placed on the critical role of regular exercise in safeguarding mental well-being. Beyond physical activity, the session also underscored the importance of early diagnosis and intervention in managing mental health challenges effectively. Michael Ashali has more in this report. Movement. The month of May has been designated as a Mental Health Awareness Month, with Ghana Mental Health Authority leading the charge under the banner of the Purple Month. At a recent event in collaboration with the Economic and Organized Crime Office, staff members were educated on the importance of staying active and incorporating exercise into their daily routines. Dr. Richard Asamoah, a psychiatrist and clinical psychologist, shared insights on the mental health breakdowns and importance of physical activity. And some of these may include very basic and simple things like changes in your appetite, changes in mood. So when I say appetite, I mean that some people may end up eating more than usual or eating less. Some people may begin to experience some sadness, being more excited than usual. Some may also experience some anxiety symptoms. You may also have changes in sleep pattern. Some people when they are stressed and they are depressed may sleep more. Others may also sleep less. So these are some signs of it. You can also have changes in how you interact with people. So talking to people, um, interacting with them may become limited. Some people may feel more isolated, not feel like talking or coming out to engage with people. So these are all signs, signs of um, mental health challenges and um, problems. Sometimes even memory problems can be a, an evidence of it. Um, having problems remembering things that you usually would easily remember. Some people will say that for, for the most part, they are the ones who would remember things and remind people in the family. But recently they're having memory problems. Poor concentration. So when they have the concentration problems and these memory problems and motivational problems, then sometimes it affects your functional work. Dr. Asamwa also challenged office workers to prioritize exercise in their daily routines. So the first thing is um, looking at prevention. So we'll talk about preventing it in the first place. Now this will involve things like having regular rest periods, um, paying attention to your mental health in the sense that you look at, um, have some time to um, have some leisure activities, also be able to have break times when you can rest, think through the day, how have things gone, and what can I do to help myself. But beyond that, also we've we'll been talking about movement, so exercise, very important. Our diet is a very important part of it. Do not sit and wait for them to get worse. Okay, talk to somebody. There are mental health experts across the country, psychiatrists, psychologists, occupational therapists. Belinda Momo Mate, head of welfare, health and safety at Yoko, shared her optimism about the training's impact on staff performance. So we make it a point that once in every year, we come up and then educate our staff on mental health and the stigma attached to it. Because one way or the other, once you are working, you'll be stressed out, among other things. We just want everyone to know that it's normal to, at times, feel down. A lot of people are going through it. It is not that you are mad. Uh -huh. So that is the motivation that we have. That's why every year we try to bring people from the Mental Health Authority to educate our staff on it. She also advocated for more companies to prioritize employee well-being. I will advise other institutions to do the same because when officers or your staff are in the right frame of mind, they understand there are no issues. They know where to channel whatever they are feeling through. I think you will have the best out of them.
And it's a wrap for this um, Joy Newsroom this afternoon. For more news, log on to myjoyonline.com. You'll find there more stories, like two more Soma Senior High School staff members arrested for allegedly stealing food items, restructuring Ghana's $5.4 billion debt, key timelines for the tortuous journey. GRA is the biggest purveyor of corruption in the public service, according to Sam George. And on the SML GRA deal, says has many candidates for jail, according to Manasse Azuri. And contracts between GRA and SML should not have existed, according to a procurement expert. And finally, on the ambulance case, AG has no intention of conducting fair prosecution. That is according to Justice Srem Sai. My name is Sweetie Abochi. Have a good afternoon.